Okay, you can turn in your Bible to Revelation chapter 7. Continuing the study. Revelation chapter 7 for Bible-believing Christians. This is not in a, uh, these next couple of chapters here. Um, you're going to start to see some of the events of the time of Jacob's trouble. And the purpose of these studies is not to go through the events and say exactly what's going to happen. Um, because dispensationally it's not pointed at Christians. But uh, we're just looking for instruction in righteousness. Some, uh, some doctrinal application there that crosses dispensational lines. Um, you're going to see that throughout the Bible. Uh, that's why you have to rightly divide. Study the whole Bible and rightly divide it. You know, one of the big lies that's made about dispensational believers, be they preachers or just, you know, people that don't preach or whatever, if you believe dispensationally, they'll say you ignore certain parts of Scripture. No, we don't. We rightly divide. But let's begin here. Revelation chapter 7. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. We'll read down to verse 3. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Okay? So, rather interesting, because people will try to make the whole book of Revelation chronological. Well, how could it be chronological when the Lord is saying in these first three verses, don't hurt the earth, and yet you read up in chapter 6, the earth has been definitely hurt quite a bit. What's going on? Revelation chapter 6 is the whole time of Jacob's trouble, beginning to end, a synopsis of the whole thing. All right, it's just a broad overview. There's not a lot of the detail. You get into more of the detail as you go through the book of Revelation. But there's a broad overview in Revelation chapter 6. That's why you see the earth being hurt. Next chapter, chapter 7 says, hurt not the earth. We're back to the beginning again, in other words. But I want to show you something interesting here. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Verse 16 through 20. Read a couple verses here. Well, again, tying it back to the Pauline epistles. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 through 20. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or power, powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Uh, it's one of the most encouraging portions of Scripture. Jesus controls everything. They say, well, yes, except for the Illuminati. Um, powers? Well, he won't control the Antichrist. Uh, yes, he will. Thrones, dominions, principalities, powers. All things were created by him and for him. Uh, Jesus controls everything. Even the people that hate him the most and make fun of him and mock him and everything else, by him all things consist. Every breath that they take, God's given them permission to take those breaths. It's really something, isn't it? And you go back to Revelation chapter 7 there, and we see that the Lord actually commands these angels, and He says, you know, don't hurt the earth. And then He also commands the wind, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Verse 1. Rather interesting. So, whenever you see things going wrong on this earth, understand and know that God is behind it, ultimately. Yes, He'll allow the wicked to do things to punish people that are doing wickedly. You know, it's why the Lord allowed Nebuchadnezzar to come in and take over Israel back there in the Old Testament. He actually calls him my servant Nebuchadnezzar at one point in time. Why? The children, children of Israel were doing wrong. They were being bad. So God used heathen, a heathen king, a heathen nation to punish people for their unrighteousness. Got to keep that stuff in mind. Don't get too worried about what's going on in this earth. All right. God's in control. 
Revelation chapter 7, verse 4, down through verse 8, we'll read about the 144,000 sealed Jews, not Jehovah's Witnesses that pay enough money, you know, and things. Revelation chapter 7, verse 4, And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Aser were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Nephilim, Nephilim were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Manasses were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Simeon were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Issachar were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Zabulon were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Joseph were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed twelve thousand. Okay? Now, something very instructive about this whole thing. I've heard this said very well. You know, there's a lot of this type of stuff back, especially in the book of Numbers in the Old Testament. So and so begot so and so, so and so begot so and so, so and so. And you go, well, man, what's all this genealogy stuff and all these numbers and this, this begat and that begat and that begat and all this stuff like this? Uh, what's the significance? Um, God cares very much about one man, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he gives all, all that genealogy stuff back in the Old Testament, and that's what's going on here. Jesus Christ made a covenant with Abraham to his physical descendants through one woman, Sarah, not through Hagar, all right? So Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, down through. Jacob's sons, a lot of them are mentioned here, but it's interesting if you look into the thing, we're not going to get into this, but there's actually, I think it's one or two of the, the sons, I think Dan and, and I'm not sure what the other one is, but they're removed from here. Hmm, interesting. They messed around with the Lord and things, and so the Lord's went and yanked them out of there. Again, that's a whole other study. Like I said, I'm not going to get into that. But whenever you see things that to you look somewhat boring to you and me, it's because God's up there saying, hey, this might not be important to you as a Gentile, but it's important to me because it's about my son, and it's about the rightful inheritance that he has coming to him, and it's a physical piece of land on this earth. The physical piece of land that's being fought for more than any other land in all of history. Matthew chapter 11 talks about it. The kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. The kingdom of heaven, the headquarters, is Jerusalem. That's why the Vatican took it from Israel back in 1993, I think it was. Hmm. Interesting. But let's continue here. Verse 9. Actually, you know what? Skipping ahead of here a little bit. Keep your hand there in Revelation chapter 7. I'm going to show you another little thing here, which I've talked about in other studies, but we'll hit it here one more time because I realize there might be somebody new that's watching and doesn't know some of these arguments. Galatians chapter 3. Turn there in Galatians chapter 3. Um, Revelation chapter 7, Galatians chapter 3. Okay, Galatians 3 verse 28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Okay, now I've talked about this many times, as any Bible-believing Christian knows. In Right now, in the church age, there's no distinction. God does not see distinction as far as privilege is concerned. Obviously, there are different rules for men and women. God does see that. All right, but as far as... Uh, spiritual privileges or things like this as far as um, spiritual rewards that are coming and things. Um, God doesn't say, oh, this guy's a Jew and that one there's a Gentile, so I eh, can't reward the Gentile as much as the Jew. God doesn't see that. We're all one in Christ Jesus. If you're Jewish, you're a Christian. If you're a Gentile, you're a Christian. If you're a man, Christian, woman, Christian, bond, free, Christian. See? But what about over there in Revelation chapter 7? Verse uh, 4 through 8, Jews. By the time you hit verse 9, let's read it. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. There's a distinction. When you hit Revelation chapter 7, we're going to see too there's a salvation distinction. Salvation is different in the time of Jacob's trouble. 
Okay, Jesus Christ is still preached. Faith in Jesus Christ is still there. Absolutely. But the means of salvation is slightly different. We have a different setup here, which I've talked about many, 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 many times. Proven from Scripture. Not my interpretation or my peculiar beliefs that didn't exist, you know, in 100, 200 years ago, whatever else. Mm -mm. What the Bible teaches. But notice there in verse 9. When this great multitude gets to heaven, God preserves their ethnicity, so to speak. John is looking at them and he's seeing them. A great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues. He sees the different ethnicities. You know, and people get all worked up about it and everything, but I really hate to tell you, God is not for integration. God does not want one big gray mass of people that have no ethnicity. You know, the common popular word would be race. You know, God wants people separate to preserve distinction. He made distinction. It's beautiful. He doesn't want everybody all blended together. And I did a whole study on that. Ironically, I think I was actually wearing the same flannel shirt when I did that. Kind of interesting. Uh, verse 10, Revelation chapter 7, verse 10. And cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. Now, this is where I got stumped. I've been working on this study now for, it's been a little while, you know. Uh, I think it was, I don't even know, a couple weeks. And I keep getting to this verse and I keep going, Salvation to our God. And I'm just like going, you know, salvation from our God, but to our God, I'm, I'm having a hard time on this. And I'm scratching my head and going, okay, Lord, you know, I don't, I don't get this. And the Lord doesn't always just say, oh, you know, what can I do for you? Sometimes he'll say, yeah, just wait, you know, well, Lord, what's it? Just hold on. He'll teach you patience, you know. And so I prayed about this passage and prayed about it and prayed about it. I looked up a couple commentaries and I'm like, eh, it doesn't really do it. And, um. Couldn't quite get it. And then the Lord gave me a scripture. You can keep your finger there in Revelation chapter 7, but go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. You see, there's a thing the Bible talks about. It's either first or second Peter. I can't remember the exact reference right now. I don't have it written on my notes, but talks about uh, the things that are hard to understand, that those are, that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, undo their own destruction. Um, there are parts of the King James Bible people say, well, that's so awkward. It's written so awkward. We have to change it to make it up to date and make it easier for the lost people to understand, which is really kind of ridiculous because lost people aren't supposed to understand the scriptures. Uh, scripture, understanding of scripture is by revelation, not by education. Very important to remember that. But uh, when you see something that's difficult to understand, it's because the Lord has a very deep hidden truth in that difficult to understand place. It's kind of like a recipe, if you will. You see some recipe and it's like, man, you got to do all this different stuff and whatever else. And you got to have all these really fine ingredients and things. Um, yeah, but you get through that recipe and it takes you a couple hours to do it. But you know what? The finished product is amazing. That's the way it is with this book. Don't approach it with a fast food mentality, if you know what I mean. Revelation, or excuse me, um, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse 14. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might, through the thanksgiving of many, redound to the glory of God. Hmm. For which cause we faint not, but through our, though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Hmm. Salvation to our God. Why did God provide man 
a means to be saved so that we could go to heaven. You understand? So we uh, go where? To God. The salvation he provides for man will bring man back to God. Like it says there in verse 15, for all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace, his abundant grace, he you know, allowed his son to die for us, the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many, thank you Lord for sending your son to die for my sins, redound to the glory of God. Redound to the glory of God. What an interesting word. What does it mean? Kind of like bounce off, okay? The Lord does things through us and we say, Praise the Lord. You know, there's an old saying that uh, imitation is the highest form of flattery. Now, you know, we can't be God, uh, obviously. But the point is, when we, when we are here and we, we show forth His righteousness and we do things that are pleasing in His sight, like we read back in Revelation chapter 4, uh, you know, I mean, we're, we're created for His pleasure, to bring the Lord pleasure. And when He looks at His creation and He sees the majority of them just wicked, just evil, terrible people and he looks down and he sees those that are saved and they shine as lights in this very dark world and he goes wow look at that they're singing praises to me when everything is falling apart in their life and that one there is putting their trust in me and this one here is praying to me i hear your prayers i'll i, I know i'm going to answer that here and, and he's what's going on we bring him pleasure the salvation he's given to us will go back to him Salvation to our God. Pretty amazing. And by the way, there are uh, verse 17 and 18. Let's read those again. They're in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. A little important to keep this stuff in mind. For our light affliction. Compare what you're going through right now with burning in hell for all of eternity. How bad is it what you're going through? Not very bad. What sickness, what financial problems, what, what uh, sadness, depression, family rejection, whatever else. Compare it to burning in a place where there's no light, there's no place, or there's nothing to drink, there's no break, no children laughing. All you hear is people screaming and cursing and forever. Oh uh, yeah, what we go through here on this on this earth in comparison to that for all of eternity, um, it's a light affliction. Very light affliction. Which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. The sufferings that you go through. If we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. The Bible says, what things you go through in this life are going to mean rewards in heaven. When you suffer for Jesus Christ, when you suffer for doing right, if you suffer for doing wrong, well, that's a problem. <laughs> You're not going to get rewards for that. But when you suffer for doing right, that's going to mean rewards in heaven. It's going to be amazing. And it's an eternal weight of glory. It'll be there forever. Verse 18, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. What are you looking at in this world? I'll grant you it's interesting to see, you know, news things and, and whatever's going on. And, you know, wow, did you hear about this? And did you hear about that rule that they're trying to pass in this legislation? And did you hear about that? And did you hear about this? Yeah, sure, I understand that. But don't get, get consumed by that. Say it that way. Don't let that stuff overtake you and start to depress you. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. It's an old hymn. Okay. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Temporal. What's temporal? Kind of an interesting word there. Temporal means the things which are seen are here on this earth, and they're all temporary. They are temporal. You understand? I mean, oh boy, it's just going to be so wicked. Oh, there's going to be riots, and there's going to be this, and there's going to be that. And what's it going to mean in 100 years? when we're sitting in the millennial kingdom and all the idols are cut off out of the land and Jesus is ruling and reigning in the, millennium, in, the in the city of Jerusalem where he rightfully deserves to be. And all this stuff, 
who do you think is going to care about what's going on right now? Nobody. It's temporal. Pretty amazing. Back to Revelation chapter 7. Verse 11. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces, and worshipped God. Now, I've said this in other studies. Angels, there are angels that are currently there in heaven, the ones that were created. But in heaven, you know, the, Jesus said the, at one point to the Sadducees, because they don't believe in the resurrection, he said, um, in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. And you do this study, and I have a whole study on angels. What are they? You can look that up. Go to the search area at my channel, main channel, and type in angels. What are they? Listen to the whole thing. Get all the scriptures. Don't say, oh, well, he didn't prove. I've done the studies, okay? I can't continually go over the same material over and over again. It'd be, you know, six hours of preaching just to prove one point. Okay, I have the studies out there. When we get to heaven, we are as the angels of God. We are like angels, okay? But we're going to be a different order of angels. Those who are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. But notice, we fall down before the throne and we worship God. Here's another interesting thing. Verse 12. Saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. How many things were there? Seven. Mm -hmm. um, there's a very interesting study out there on the study of numbers in the Bible. And God has a definite system of numbers in the Bible. This number of things means that, that number means this, whatever else. And Satan, of course, takes it, he perverts it, he twists it into numerology. Uh, so don't, you know, you hear somebody and they say, oh, there's Christians that believe in numbers, specific numbers in the Bible. Yeah, that's what the Bible teaches. They say, well, that's numerology. No, it's not numerology. Numerology is apart from Scripture, right? And they'll try to use things from Scripture in their own wicked system and things. But you don't throw out, you know, God's system of numbers in your Bible because a bunch of occultists are trying to pervert it. All right. That doesn't make any sense. But let's look at these. Because you see, we as angels in the resurrection, we're going to be there and we're going to be worshiping God for seven reasons. Number one, you have blessing. Let's see what we have here for Christians. Galatians chapter 3. Keep your finger there in Revelation chapter 7. We'll be coming back to it here. Galatians chapter 3. Uh, verse 13 and 14. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the law, or from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Jesus was cursed on the tree. That's where he said, Father, you know, uh, why hast thou for, forsaken me? Okay. All of the sin was paid for on the cross. Okay, don't believe any Satanists that try to tell you that Jesus had to burn in hell for three days. That is satanic nonsense. All right. Verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Did you know that you have a tremendous blessing as a Christian? That blessing is we're going to be able to have a part in the inheritance that comes to the Jewish people. We're going to be there for the millennial kingdom. That's promised to the Jews. We're going to get to rule and reign with Christ. What a tremendous blessing. That's why it is completely, totally, 100% unnatural for a Christian to hate the nation of Israel right now. I mean, why on earth would you? And again, I've done the studies on this. The nation of Israel is not supposed to come back to their homeland in as Bible-believing Christians. I mean, what would be the point of the time of Jacob's trouble? I mean, some of this stuff is just so common sense. It's just like these people, well, I don't think you, you can prove. You're lost. You're lost. <laughs> I don't know what else to tell you. I mean, the Jews come back as Christians in belief, and God gives them their land back. Israel and Jerusalem as the capital city. 
because they're back now, they're Christians, they believe in Jesus Christ. And then he turns around and he pours out seven years of his judgment, the time of Jacob's trouble, upon Christian Jews in Jerusalem and Israel. <laughs> huh? <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, have these people read the Old Testament? Constantly the Jews are turning against God and God's going, whip, whipping them and whipping them and whipping them and they don't learn their lesson. They do a little bit, they get a little bit good and then they go back again. They start wor worshiping false gods and whatever else. This theme is consistent all throughout the Bible. Right now the Jews are in unbelief, but they're in the land. And all these other heretics, oh, the Jews, they've been replaced, the Jews have been replaced, you know, we're the, we're the true Jews, we're the Hebrews, you know, and all stuff. Okay, then you belong on a piece of real estate over in Israel. Get off of your tail end there and get on a plane or on a boat or whatever and go to Israel. All right? Go on over. Go there and you walk up to the first Jew and you say, hey, you're on my land. I'm a true Jew. You're a fake. So you get off of my land. Try it. <laughs> you know, they aren't about to. But the blessings that we have as Christians, the blessings that have been upon the different nations out there and things where we still have freedom, it's because we have been good to the nation of Israel. And I'm so thankful that now there's been this reversal of this wicked, disgusting sanctions, UN sanctions put against Israel where they were supposed to give back part of Jerusalem and, and a bunch of other things that they supposedly were illegally occupying and things like this. It's funny because, you know, uh, we need to have a two-state solution, you know. We need to be able to have the Palestinians and the Jews living together in peace. So we're going to take the land from the Jews and give it to the Palestinians in, and then we'll have peace even though the Palestinians already have land, you know, totally encircling all of Israel, and yet they're attacking and killing Jews all the time. But we got to give them more land because that'll stop the killings, right? Now that will increase the killings. And anybody that says the Jews are illegally on their land, you're not dealing with a Bible-believing Christian. You are dealing with a Bible-rejecting son of the devil. I might do a little video or something like that and just come out and say dispensational Christians stand with the nation of Israel. We don't agree with them. We say, hey, you're on your way to hell. If you die in your sins, you're going to go to hell. God's chosen people and the whole deal, burning in hell. Yeah, sure. You reject Jesus Christ, you go to hell. Simple. But as far as their right to be on that land, they have every right according to the scriptures. Every single right in the world. And I will say that until the day of my death because I want God's blessing to be upon my life. And God's blessing has been there many times when I bless that nation of Israel. And I pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And I will continue to do so. Secondly, we have there in verse 12, Revelation chapter 7, verse 12, starts out blessing, then we have glory. Okay? Again, you can keep your hand there. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world and things which are despised. Hello. <laughs> Hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Wow. Are we going to be able to worship the Lord and say wisdom and, or excuse me, blessing and glory belongs to God? Yes. Why? Because we look at ourselves, we look at ourselves in the mirror and we say, God saved that thing? Yeah. He saved me, wicked old sinner like me, and then put me into the ministry? 
It's like, are you crazy, Lord? <laughs> you know, I don't have any abilities. I can't do you know anything. I wanted so bad when I first was you know getting into ministry. I wanted so bad to get involved in a good uh, you know local church and uh, just be there and just be this off the scenes kind of guy that would just serve and whatever else. I didn't want to be in any kind of spotlight or anything, you know. But God chooses the foolish things to confound the wise. And the Lord spoke, you know, He speaks through me and things, and I understand that. And it's there's a lot of wise people that have been confounded. And all glory belongs to the Lord for that. I can't take any glory. Are you kidding me? And people say, you know, uh, oh, you, will you, you know, do your videos in front of your book collection? Yes, that's true. You know why? Because a lot of times I refer to these books while I'm preaching. I'll grab one and say, oh yeah, okay, here's the book and things. It's convenient to have my books there. Secondly, I don't exactly have a huge big mansion someplace where I can have a library somewhere and a, and a you know, $100,000 TV studio someplace else or something. All right, I'm limited in my, you know, different rooms here. Okay, so I'm not trying to make myself look super intelligent. I mean, if I wanted to do that, I wouldn't be showing up in a flannel shirt, okay? I'd be in a nice suit and tie, probably clean shaven and whatever else. Something else. People or something. <laughs> so when the Lord does something through you, you give God the glory for that, okay? Because that's what we're going to be doing in eternity. Back to Revelation chapter 7. Verse 12, we have blessing, glory, and then next what comes, we have wisdom. Interesting. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, verse 17 through 19. It says here that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power oh uh, that's one of the ways i will judge somebody's salvation okay i hear from people and they say you know oh, thank the lord i just got saved you know and things and and you start trying to show them truth or whatever, and they're like, well, I don't know. I don't know if I could do that. And they get real nervous about truth. I have some questions there. But I've seen people there, you know, that he may give you, verse 17 there, may give you, or may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Oh, yeah. I've seen people, and they're just like lost, and all of a sudden they get saved. And man, within like the first couple of weeks, sometimes a couple of hours, whatever, but you know, it's just like all of a sudden their eyes are open and they're going, whoa, I did not understand that. Are you kidding me? That's what that means? I saw that all my life. I didn't know what that meant. Oh, that's behind this. You know what? What happens? Your eyes are open. Kind of like the study I did about the blind man there that Jesus, you know, healed the blind man, you know? Very interesting tie in there. God will give you wisdom when you get saved. And when you look at this world, all of a sudden you look, start looking at this world a lot differently. I remember as a lost man, I would look at this world and I would be, I was majorly into motorcycles and things. And I've told this story before, but you know, I was to the point where I could tell you motorcycle would go, go by and I'd start rattling off facts about it. The motor size, the, you know, who makes it, makes it what the price is, the horsepower, the top speed, the, Blah, 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 blah. You know, I just like memorized every motorcycle that was out there. Except for Harleys. I never was into a Harley Davidson kind of guy, but <laughs> I liked speed and power, you know, so Harley doesn't have either one. But, uh, uh, <laughs> sure, there's probably people mad about that, but that's, eh, eh, you know, whatever. But, um, you know, of course, a lot of the Japanese bikes now look just like Harleys and sound just like Harleys and everything, so whatever. But, um, you know, I was very impressed by the world, and I thought very highly of the world, and I had all my plans. I'm, I'm a certified motorcycle repair technician, actually. I went through training, and I was going to be a motocross racer and all this other stuff, you know, and I and, uh, wanted to be famous, you know, and the Lord was like, no, had other plans for my life. I think, I'm thankful he did, 
thankful for what all the Lord's done for me. But I'll tell you what, when I got saved, it was just like it didn't go too long and I started having my eyes open and I'm going, whoa, okay, yeah, I was really, really, really deceived in my lost life and man, you know, and I get around other Christians and things and I start talking truth and they just like, and it's just like we're feeding off each other. Yeah, but did you know? Did you ever hear? Heck, got a tape you got to watch. You, you, you got to see this video. Did you ever read this book? You know, and things. It's exciting you get around another Christian. Their eyes are open. Your eyes are open. Then you get around other uh, Christians and, they, and you say, did you ever know about the Catholic Church? Did you ever know about the thing? And they go, Oh yeah, well that's uh, that's that's interesting. Yeah. Oh well, would you like to come to church sometime? And you're like, not on your life. No, <laughs> you're freaking me out right now. Okay, I feel very weird around you. Uh, kind of like I'm, you know, around or talking to a lost person. Probably because you are. But let's continue here. God will give you wisdom, and we're going to thank Him for that in eternity. Okay, verse 12 there, Revelation chapter 7, verse 12. What's the next one? Thanksgiving. All right. Colossians chapter 2. Go to Colossians chapter 2. And again, remember these angels that are falling down there, they're, I believe that they are Christians, redeemed Christians. They're with the 24 elders. So they're there. It's the same group that we read about in Revelation chapter 5. So these are the things we're going to be thanking God for in eternity. For all of eternity, too, forever and ever. Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Let's read this. For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. Very instructive there because if you look at Revelation chapters uh, 2 through 3, you see seven churches there. And some have said, well, you know, you can kind of make it... Um, for instruction in righteousness, you can look at it as seven periods in church history, and it ends with the Laodicean church period where they're neither cold nor hot, they're lukewarm. I think that's very true in many ways. So we have it. this portion of the letter to the Colossian believers is written to, uh, or written, you know, about the uh, Laodiceans. But uh, check this out, verse 2. That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, and in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Do you ever feel like you're really, really, really rich because of all the Lord showed you? I mean, seriously, seriously. I, I feel like I'm incredibly wealthy sometimes because of all the Lord has shown me in my life as a Christian. It's just amazing. I'm just going around going, man, these people are so deceived. And it's just like I'd love to tell them about it, but they don't want to hear it. They're not saved. They can't understand it anyhow. You know, it's just, it's incredible. Verse 4, And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. That's how they come after you, these false prophets. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein, in Christ, with thanksgiving. Yeah. Understanding what all the Lord has showed you, understanding how he saved you, understanding the example that the Lord Jesus leaves you, and then, you know, through Paul as well, you know, and it's just like amazing to have this book and you can read it and, and just, and Lord does things in your life and you see him working in your life. It's just, wow. You know what you do? Thanksgiving. You say, well, man, I can't wait to get to heaven. I'm going to thank the Lord when I get there. Boy, it's, it's uh, going to be wonderful. Well, that's good. But you know what? You need to thank him here in this life. Thank him. Be thankful. Okay. It's very, very important. Now, next we have, back to Revelation chapter 7, verse 12. First we had blessing, then we have glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, and honor. Hmm. First Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians 4. 
I'm going to have to probably make some kind of place where I can set my Bible. A little pulpit or something like this. used to have one, but, you know, from way back when I was at our house church. But uh, I had to use up some of the wood from it, and so I ended up getting rid of it. And I wish I had it. But uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. Now that your life is supposed to get better, clean it up more and more as time goes by. For we know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Hmm, there's that word. Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Do you ever have somebody say to you that, uh, oh, you're one of those holier-than-thou Christians? And you go, well, you know, try to make excuse. Don't make excuse. You're supposed to be. You are supposed to be holier than the lost world. You are supposed to have better morals and convictions than the average alley cat out there in the world. All right? You're not supposed to go out and be a fornicator. You say, well, brother, I don't fornicate. Do you watch uh, fornication on TV or movies? Well, it's just entertainment, and I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Those scriptures come to mind. Uh, you're not supposed to have anything to do with fornication. You say, well, brother, I'm okay. You see, because I don't fornicate physically. I don't fornicate by watching movies, so I'm good. Uh, what about uh, Mystery Babylon? She goes out and fornicates. Do you have uh, Catholic friends? Or take it easy, take a lighter view on Catholicism. She wants to fornicate. She wants to come in and embrace everyone. We're all the same. We can agree to disagree. No, we can't. You say, well, brother, my, my boss is a Catholic at work. I could get in a lot of trouble. With who? Your boss or with God? We have a responsibility to be holy and to uh, possess our vessel in sanctification and honor. Are you an honorable Christian in God's sight? We all have to check ourselves, okay? You say, quit judging me. Okay, you judge yourself. The Holy Spirit will be there to, you know, tell you what's wrong. I don't know each of your situations, but the Lord does. And the Lord knows my problems and my issues that I struggle with. Hmm. Something to think about, brethren. Revelation chapter 7, verse 12. What comes next? We have power comes next. All right. How about that? 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Went over this a couple weeks back in the five, five Steps to Sanctification study. But we'll hit it again if you haven't seen that study. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. His strength. What would be another way to say that? His uh, power? He said, well, yeah, keep reading. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. You know, there have been times I have literally felt like just, just a, I don't even know what. I mean, just totally weak, just. I can only even have the strength, and I, I'm like, I just can't go on. I can't do this anymore. And I'm like, Lord, you know, I don't want to die because I have a wife and a little boy, you know. And I went through this just a couple of days ago, and it was just 
just so weak and it's just like the Lord just kind of scoops me up and takes me through the rest of the day I start feeling a little bit better and he goes get to bed I go to bed wake up the next day and I'm like oh I feel so much better got me through another one you know I go through it you'll go through it you'll have so many situations I mean I hear from Christians all over the world and it's just like brother I'm going through this brother I'm going through that and, and I'm just going, man, body of Christ has it rough. You know, this whole positive, practical Christianity junk, Joel Osteen, best life now, all this stuff like that, that's not Bible-believing Christianity. Christians in the Bible, man, they have it rough. They go through some rough stuff. But the power of God can be there when you're weak. You know, it's real easy to say, pray the Lord and say, thank you, Lord, for all that's going on good in my life. I got plenty of money. I got good food. This is happening. I got a good day. It's sunny outside. Beautiful. Oh, wow. Thank you. I'm going, you know, having a good day today. It's nice to praise him then. But when you're sick and you just feel like I don't even want to do anything. I'm just so sick. I'm just, I wish I could die, but there's people that need me. And, you know, <laughs> you're just down and depressed. And things are going wrong. It just everything's falling apart and you're just like ah. that's when his power comes in and that's when we get to eternity and we finally say wow there's no headache boy I can breathe good but my lower back pain's gone Boy, that pain in my fingers that's going too wow that pain here in my oh boy my knees are good and man I feel good we can thank the Lord through that His power got us through those rough times. Another reason why we're going to be worshiping Him forever. I mean, we're going to get to heaven, and you know, there's been so many times when we go through things here as Christians in this life, and we don't even know why we're going through it. You know, I've heard it said to one time, you know, if you have car problems, thank the Lord for it, because He could very well have saved you from being in a really bad accident. And I've had that happen. I mean, I've gone, up, I've been coming up to intersections, and somebody just goes, like 70 miles an hour right through a red light and I'm like if I'd have been there you know five seconds earlier that guy would have broadsided me I'd be dead but before I left something went wrong or I forgot something in the house or whatever else and I went back in and I'm like oh, I'm gonna be late and you know God's got everything planned everything and when we get to eternity and we, you know, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it t talks about we shall know even as we are also known. And we're going to get there and all of a sudden we're just going to go, wow, talk about, you know, the eyes of our understanding being opened and enlightened. <laughs> it's going to be like, Ooh, I mean, our eyes are going to pop out of our heads when we get to heaven. And we're going to look around and we're going to be like, wow, okay, there's a lot of people that are not here that I thought were going to be here. And there's some people that are here that I didn't think were going to make it. And Okay, brother, sister, wow. Hey, it's good to see you guys. And Okay, there's Jesus, and he doesn't look anything like I thought he was going to look. Whoa, okay, and wow, I feel really good, and wow, Lord, you really did a lot for me. I had no idea. And you're going to realize how many times it was his power that got you through a day. His power that helped you. And you thought to yourself, wow, you know, I, I'm glad. I must, must have been something I ate that was making me feel bad or whatever else, you know. You're going to get there to eternity and you're going to go, that was a spiritual attack and the Lord protected me. That's why we're going to be worshiping Him forever. And seeing no end to it, saying, you know, well, okay, well, you know, I... Thank you, Lord. I appreciate what you did for me. But, you know, I got some other things I need to do here. I got to hang out and stuff. We're going to get there and we're going to go, wow, salvation to our God. I am here to worship forever. It's going to be amazing. Finally, in verse 12, we have might. Kind of like strength. It doesn't mean I might do something. Go to Ephesians chapter 3 Ephesians chapter 3 verse 13 Wherefore I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you which is your glory For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ 
New versions, by the way, they'd mess with that verse and they take out of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look it up. So you're bowing your knees to the Father. Pick your local Catholic priest, you know, and there's the Father that you can bow your knees to. I mean, look it up. It's there. Verse 15. Of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ might dwell, may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be fill, filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. There's the worship for all of eternity. And we look and again we see his might there. And the might comes from what? We as Christians are connected to the Lord Jesus Christ. We are part of his body. Isn't that incredible? I mean, you know, you can kind of like theologically understand, you know, well, yeah, it's the Bible says, but we don't often, we can't really fully grasp this thing yet. Why? We walk by faith, not by sight. But Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight, you see, when we go to be with the Lord. It's going to be wonderful. Again, inspiring us to worship the Lord forever. Pretty amazing. Go back to Revelation chapter 7. Verse 13. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? Okay. So one of the elders, the 24 elders there that are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, read Revelation chapter 5, they're crowned before the first seal is opened, so they represent Bible-believing Christians. And they're there, and they say, Hey, John, what are these which are arrayed in white robes? What were the white robes there? Verse 9, clothed with white robes. So he's talking about this group that came out. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> Read the next verse. Verse 14, and I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Okay, notice a couple things. It does not say they came out of the Great Tribulation. Again, I've done the whole big study on this. Every reference to the word tribulation, it's always a description. You're going to have tribulation in any dispensation, right? That's always going to be there. This time period that's coming, yes, there will be Great Tribulation. It's not a title. It's a description. It's so important to get. Because, see, when you make it into a title, then you say, well, here's verses over here that say a Christian goes through tribulation, so that means we're going through the Great Tribulation. This whole thing's a lie this tribulation stuff. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7, also Daniel's 70th week, back in the book of Daniel. It's never once called the tribulation or the great tribulation. So important to get that. But notice something also that's very, very important here. I got to switch. Got to get my notes here. Give me a minute. The uh, thing in there about they're washing their robes Hmm. Is that for a Christian? Absolutely not. Christians don't wash their robes. We're washed. We, ourselves, are washed in the blood of the Lamb. Let's see if I can get this thing back on here again. Okay, Revelation chapter 1. Turn to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Verse 6, And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So, two ways that you know that this is written to Christians and not to saints in the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, the second one that we saw there, we'll say that's point number one, Hath made, hath made us kings and priests. All right, that's millennial reign with Jesus Christ, ruling and reigning as kings and priests. All right, um, that's going to be there for a Christian. 
Those promises are not for other people. Okay? But more importantly, verse 5, washed us from our sins in His own blood. We are washed. We're not washing our robes to make them white. Okay, let me prove that to you. Turn to the book of Acts, chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Written to Christians. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. He purchased the church. He didn't say, hey, the blood's there, now come and wash your robes in it. See? But you see, back in Revelation, you can go back there, Revelation chapter 7, uh, in that time period, the time of Jacob's trouble, you have people that are going to have to live without taking the mark of the beast. It's going to be very difficult. Not to mention the fact that uh, Revelation chapter 14 talks about the faith of Jesus and the commandments, keeping the commandments. So it's going to be rough in that time period. And people are going to be able to do it. There's going to be a great multitude that gets saved because there's no more fooling around. There's no more... Well, maybe the Bible's true, but maybe not. I don't maybe portions of the Bible will be confirmed in that time. They won't be living completely by faith. There's going to be a lot of sight. Right? I mean, it, as Christians today, there's plenty of things that we can see going on in the world and we go, "Wow, right there. Look at that. That's prophecy being fulfilled." But when we leave, when the body of Christ leaves and it goes back to the Jews, the Jews require a sign. And those Jews, the time of Jacob's trouble, you know, Jacob being Israel, those Jews are going to get seven years of sign, signs and wonders to prove that the New Testament is accurate and to show them who their Messiah is, the one that they rejected, like you read about, about back in the book of Zechariah. Very interesting. Verse 15. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. Okay, millennial kingdom. Right, this is what this is talking about. Verse 15 is millennial kingdom. And then you have verse 16 and 17 is eternity. All right, verse 15 there. Therefore are they before the throne of God. Where's that at? The throne. The king comes and he sits on his throne in Jerusalem in Matthew chapter 25, for the judgment of the nations. And then the goats go on to the left hand, and they go into the lake of fire. The sheep on the right hand go into the millennial kingdom. And Jesus Christ sits on his throne in Jerusalem, the city of the great king. Again, you can read about that in Matthew chapter 5. It talks about the city of the great king, Jerusalem. And he goes there, and he's sitting on his throne. And the saints, from the time of Jacob's trouble, serve him there before his throne. There. And they serve him day and night in his temple. There's still going to be day and night on the earth and the millennial kingdom, but not in eternity. In eternity, you read about back in the end of the book of Revelation, there's no night. Okay? So what we're seeing here is, verse 15 is the millennial kingdom. Bible-believing Christians today will rule as kings and priests in the millennial kingdom. Time of Jacob's trouble saints are going to be there as servants in the throne room before God. Verse 16, They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away uh, all tears from their eyes. And there is going to be plenty of tears flowing from the eyes of people that miss the rapture. And the question is, are you going to miss the rapture? Are you truly saved? If the Lord Jesus came back today, would you be going or staying? You say, well, brother, I put my faith in Jesus. I prayed to prayer and stuff like that. Okay, has there been a change in your life? Have the eyes of your understanding been opened? Have you received the wisdom of God? Can you go through verse 12 and say, yes, he's given me blessing, glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, power, and might? Can you worship the Lord and say, He did all these things in my life? You say, well, you know, I don't know. But it's to me, you know, I, I, just, I just trust. I just believe. Well, you might want to spend a little bit more time thinking about eternity. 
and just kind of thinking about it like, uh, yeah, you know, whatever. I, I'm pretty sure I changed the oil in my car, you know, when I should have. I don't know. Yeah, whatever, you know. And people are so flippant about eternity. I mean, you realize if you mess up here, if you say, I've come to Jesus Christ in the wrong spirit, in the wrong understanding of Scripture, what the Bible teaches, do you realize if you mess up, you go to hell forever? You better think about it. You better think about it. And when these false prophets are telling you, your sins don't matter, there doesn't have to be a changed life, whatever else, you just come to God and say, yes, I'm a sinner, all people are sinners. Uh, yeah, I just put my faith in you. You know, I don't even, I'm not even going to pray. I'm not going to, whatever. I just, uh, you know, I just believe. I'm in. You better watch out for that. There has to be a change in your life. It will come naturally after true salvation. Make sure you get that thing figured out. Don't want to end up in hell for all of eternity. All right? Because if you do not have this thing figured out, you're going to find yourself in this time of Jacob's trouble, and you're going to realize how bad things are going to be getting. You're actually going to be going through God's wrath, through God's judgment. I'm not. I'm leaving. See ya. If you want to go through it. And, uh, you're going to have some tears if you miss the rapture. I pray you get saved. So let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, again, I thank you so much, Lord, for all that you do for us as Christians, um, for saving me, for saving my brothers and sisters in Christ out there, uh, just for amazing things, Lord, that uh, I've seen you do in my life and I've seen you do in, in other people's lives. They contact me and they tell me about their experiences that they're having. Lord, it's just amazing. And uh, we haven't even hit eternity yet. And Lord, I just pray that you would help all of us to, to stay in your word, to stay strong, to walk in your power, Lord, in your might, not of our own uh, power and might, but of yours. And uh, to rely on your word, no matter how bad things get. And to know that our suffering here is just a light affliction compared to the eternity of heaven that's coming. Lord, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would be out there to, to convict of sin, but also to comfort. You said that you would send a comforter. And Lord, we need that comforter. It gets rough sometimes. And I just pray, Lord, that your power would be mightily upon those that are trusting in your word and waiting for the, the rapture. And I pray it wouldn't be too far off, Lord. And I just ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, that's going to be it for Revelation chapter 7. I'm going to be doing Revelation chapter 8 here next. I'm going to be playing it another week or so probably. I have some, a big research project that I need to spend some time on. and it, I'm not sure how long it's going to take me, but I uh, really need to get to it. And I, I can't take a break and record another sermon, so I'm going to get that done. And uh, So please continue praying for the ministry. Very important in these very troubled times. Uh, we do pray for you, our viewers, and uh, some of you by your exact situation you're going through. Uh, some of you, we just pray the Lord keeps you in His Word and keeps you true to His Word. So that's going to be it. We will see you in the next study.